Hopefully everyone this evening, hope everyone has had a good day today. Have you ever wanted to say something to someone that was hurting or struggling, but you didn't know what to say? Sometimes we just keep our mouths shut and run the risk of appearing uncaring. But then at other times we go ahead and we open our mouths and with the best of intentions, sometimes we say things that just make matters worse. One example of this, a recent funeral that I worked, an elderly gentleman had passed away. And as, was, as is common in our southern customs, during the final viewing, his wife of 72 years was sitting in a wheelchair next to the casket, weeping, mourning over the loss of her husband. And the man who had preached this funeral he was watching this scene unfold and desiring to extend a little bit of comfort to her. He went over to her, knelt down, put his arm around her, and he said, it's okay, you'll be with him again soon. When we are facing times of grief and pain, it's always a comfort to know that there are people who sympathize and empathize with us. They understand the things that we're going through and we know that they are there to support us during those difficult times. These comforters have a potential to be wonderful, welcoming comforters. But likewise, they have the ability as well to be sorry comforters. The book of Job addresses possibly the most difficult of life's questions. And that question is this, why do we suffer? Or we could expand upon that and we could say, why does God allow man to suffer? The lesson that we're going to be looking at tonight deals with the sufferings of Job, but it's going to look at it from the standpoint of three of Job's friends. Three men that came to him with the initial goal of extending some comfort to him. But in the long run, they turned out to be pretty sorry comforters. Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they decided among themselves, Job 2 and verse 11 says, they made an appointment together to come and to sympathize with him and comfort him. But whenever they came to where he was, they didn't even recognize him. His physical condition was so poor, he was in such bad shape, that they did not even recognize that he was Job. And when they saw this, they lifted up their voices and they cried out in their sorrow and they put dust upon their heads, showing the sadness that they felt. They, excuse me, they wept over the condition that they found their friend in. But interestingly, these three friends sat with Job for seven days. And for seven days, they did not utter a single word. But then, they made a mistake. At the end of those seven days, they finally decided somebody needs to say something. And a lot of times when we get that kind of mentality in our heads, we're setting ourselves up to say something that we don't really need to say. Because sometimes silence is all that people need. Well, after several speeches are made, all three of these friends take their turn and essentially they condemn Job. They tell him, you're suffering with these things because you had to have done something wrong. You had to have sinned against God, therefore that's why all of this suffering is coming upon you. Well, after Job sits there and he listens to all of this, he finally makes the statement in Job 16 in verse 2. He says, you are miserable comforters, all of you. Some of the modern translations say, you are sorry comforters. Comforters. 
And that's a statement that makes more sense to us today when we think about someone being a, a sorry character. The things that they were doing, they weren't accomplishing any type of good whatsoever. All they were doing was serving to tear down Job to condemn him for something that they perceived to be wrong in his life. But ultimately, in the end, they were the ones that ended up being criticized by God. They were judged by God. And ultimately, they had to repent for the sins that they had committed in this conversation that they had engaged in. But they didn't get everything wrong. They did a few things right. For example, we find at least three areas where they were helpful to Job. First off, they were empathetic. They came and they were with him and they showed their sadness over what he was going through. But not only that, they were willing to sit there with him. They were willing to be in silence, simply to be a comforting presence for seven days. For a week they sat there in the presence of Job just so that he would not be by himself. So that he would have someone there that cared about him. They were in his presence. But we find that ultimately the, the main thing that they did right was they came to him. So often we hear about people that are struggling, people that are suffering and we don't do anything about it. We don't go see them. We don't call them on the phone. We don't see if there's any kind of assistance that we can offer. And sometimes it comes back to what I mentioned earlier. Sometimes we're afraid that we'll say or do something that's going to make the situation worse. When ultimately what happens is we come across as seeming uncaring. But finally, they broke their silence. And we find recorded 21 chapters of material think about this 21 chapters of text where these three men are doing nothing but tearing Job down telling him that he had sinned against God telling him that he had done something wicked telling him that he was not a righteous man telling him that he needed to repent but finally Job has enough of it. And he says, you guys are sorry comforters. He shuts them down. He says, I'm not going to listen to it anymore. You're not helping. The first of these friends that we find that speaks is a man by the name of Eliphaz the Temanite. He's introduced to us in Job the second chapter. He is one of Job's friends that have come to him that's going to try to comfort him in some way. But along with these other two, he fails miserably in his attempts to bring comfort and support to his friend. We find he starts out showing some signs of sympathy. He starts out speaking things that might be comforting to his friend but all of that ends by the time that we get to chapters 12 and 13. For in chapters 12 and 13, any sign of comfort that was there before has all disappeared. It has all turned into accusations. It has all turned into assumptions. It has all turned into pleas for Job to repent of some unknown sin that they think must be in his life. Well, after Job speaks up and he, he complains about the things that they're saying. He tells them that, that they're being sorry comforters. Well, Eliphaz is not satisfied. And he speaks up and he issues what we could call a, a thesis statement of the chapter. And he, he talks about how those who are innocent are the ones that are going to prosper. But those who are guilty, those are the ones that suffer. And therefore, Job must have done something wrong. He was not innocent of sin or he would be prospering and he would not be suffering in the way that he was. So what Job had to say to these men, it went in one ear and out the other. They didn't listen to the things that he said even though he said, you're not helping matters. They still took it a step further. They still pressed on. 
because they thought they were right and Job was wrong. And they were doing everything in their power to convince Job that what they were assuming was the truth. Which all along Job knew that he had not done anything wrong. He knew that he was a good man, a righteous man. No, he did not understand why these sufferings were taking place. But he accepted them and he knew that if he remained faithful to God, that things would work out. But these friends wouldn't hear of that. They continued to believe that he had to have done something wrong. Well, in Eliphaz's second speech, after he has said all of these condemning things, he then comes back, he says, well, Job, you just don't fear God enough. How many times do we hear people say today, well, you just don't have enough faith, or you're just not strong enough in your faith, therefore that's why you're struggling and you're suffering the way that you are. Well, that's the argument that he came back with. He says, you don't respect God enough, and therefore since you don't respect God, then God is punishing you for your lack of respect. He tells Job that if you loved and respected God the way that you should, that you know well, you wouldn't be suffering in these ways. But even then it wasn't enough. Even then he goes on. Now remember they've had seven days to think about all these things. They've had seven days of sitting there in silence, looking at their friend, seeing him suffer, and coming up with all these assumptions in their mind as to what could be bringing these things about. Well, in chapter 22, Eliphaz goes into a third speech. And in this third speech, he says, Is not your wickedness great and your iniquities without end? He says you're living in sin. He said there's something in your life that's just not right. Your iniquities are without end. That's why you're suffering. Because you're not repenting. You're not removing from your life whatever it is that has caused God to bring this suffering upon you. Well, by looking at this and examining this way, the assumption they were making was that God only allows evil to come upon those who are wicked. But we know that that's not the case. For we all have seen instances in life, possibly even in our own lives, where we've seen suffering and trials come, maybe even upon ourselves. And we know that we did not do anything that was sinful in nature that would warrant God to do something like that. And so this argument that they're making, there was no grounds for it at all. But yet they were throwing out all these ideas. They were throwing out all of these thoughts that they had, telling Job, well, this is why. This is why you're going through all these things. I'll be the first one to tell you, I, I'm a problem solver. If someone comes to me and they have a problem, I like to try to come up with a way to help. My wife hates that. I cannot tell you how many times that she has come to me and, and presented some type of problem or some kind of an issue and I'll start spurting out all of these ideas of ways that she could work on that or ways that she could fix that and she'll say, Josh, I just want you to listen. I don't want you to fix it. I know how to fix it. But that's human nature sometimes. A lot of times that's how men are. We are fixers. We try to find a solution to whatever uh, issues may come along. Well, sometimes, and it's the way that Job was at this point, he just needed someone there with him, just some kind of comfort. He didn't need these people trying to come up with assumptions and trying to figure out ways that, that he could get around the sufferings that he was going through. No, he didn't know why he was suffering, but he knew that if he remained faithful to God, that those sufferings were not going to last forever. He knew that God was going to take care of this problem. But then we come to his second friend. His second friend was named Bildad the Shuhite. Bildad was another of these three friends. He comes, he is astonished by what he sees. He cries out in, in anguish over his friend and then he sits there with him for seven days. 
Well, after he listens to the things that Eliphaz has to say, Bildad decides that he has some things that he wants to say. He couldn't let Eliphaz be the only one to talk. He has his own assumptions, his own ideas. And so when Eliphaz finishes, our second sorry comforter comes to the podium, so to speak. He opens his mouth and he begins to spew out the things that he believes. And folks, he starts in the absolute last place that he should have started. You remember one of the ways that Job was suffering was that he lost all of his children. All of his children died. One of the first things that Bildad said is, your children deserved it. Your children deserved it. Folks, it does not matter how sinful of a life our children may be living, you don't use something like that as a form of comfort toward a parent. And here was a man who had lost his children. They all had died. And this man thinks it's going to be comforting to him to say, you know what, this happened to your children because they deserved it. That doesn't make sense to me why he would assume that, that that was something that was acceptable to say. He said they must have been living their lives in such a way that God just finally had enough. That God just, just struck them dead because of the way that they were living. They must have done something wrong and had to be punished. Well, Job... He replies to this, he says, If you would seek and, imp and implore the compassion of the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, surely now he would rouse himself for you and restore your righteous state. This is in chap chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. He says that if you would pay heed to the Lord. He said, your children died because they were not faithful, because they did something wrong. He said, and that's what's about to happen to you. You're dying because you're not being faithful to the Lord and unless you want the same doom that came upon your children to come upon you, then you need to turn back to the Lord. Well, Job, after listening to two speeches from this man, he says in chapter 18 and verse 2, he says, How long will you torment me with these words? How long are you going to crush me with the things that you're saying? So he's already told them that they're being sorry comforters. Now he's come back and he's told them, you're tormenting me even more so. You're making things even more difficult upon me with the things that you're saying. He says, you're crushing me with the things that you're saying. But yet... That still wasn't enough. Bildad goes on to give a third speech to Job. In chapter 25, in verse 4, he says, How then can a man be just with God, or how can he be clean who is born of woman? Basically, he says, it's impossible for you to be right with God. So he takes this to the ultimate extreme. He said, there is no way for a human being to truly be righteous. There is no way for a person to be right with God. Therefore, you are suffering essentially because you're a human being. You're a human man and God is causing you to suffer because everybody suffers. It's kind of like the old saying that we hear people say, well, just get up and shake it off. Or we see those that have endured the same kinds of things and they talk about it being no big deal. Just get up and keep going. Just move on from this point. Well, Job, these were not the things that he needed to hear. These were not the words. These were not the assumptions. This was not the comfort that he was desiring. But then after both of these men have spoke, the third man is still sitting there. 
and he decides he needs to say some things as well. This third man's name was Zophar the Naamathite. He was with these other two when they showed up seven days prior. He saw the state that Job was in. He sat there with him in silence for seven days. He saw the pain. He saw the anguish. He saw the emotional distress that Job must have been in. He's already listened to the things that these other two men have said. He's heard what Eliphaz said and how Job said to him that they were sorry comforters. He's listened to the things that Bildad had to say and how Job said to him, you're crushing me with your words. So Zophar, he's probably looking at this situation saying, well, these two have failed, but maybe I can say something that will help matters. Maybe there's something else that needs to be said or maybe it can be said in another way. And it will bring about this comfort that Job was needing. Zophar's first speech begins in Job chapter 11. And in Job chapter 11, he starts out with the strongest initial statement of any of these three friends. Notice what he says in verse 6. He says, Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. He says, You're getting off easy. He says, you are guilty of death, but you look at what you're getting off with. The things that you're suffering, he, he says, you deserve so much worse. So basically, he's trying to pump him up by telling him what you're going through is not really that bad. God's letting you get off easy. Well, once again, these were not the things that Job needed to hear. And after Zophar spends two chapters addressing the fact that Job could not be innocent, that he was deserving of death because of his guilt, Job finally stops him. And in verse 18 of chapter 13, he says, I know I will be vindicated. He was so secure in his relationship with God, that he knew that everything was going to be okay. He didn't know what was going to transpire. He didn't know what the future held, but he knew that one way or the other, everything was going to be okay. And so he tells these friends, he says, I know everything's going to be fine. I know that I am going to be vindicated for these things. Well, Zophar's second speech he starts off again. In chapter 20, verses 28 and 29, he says, The increase of his house will depart. His possessions will flow away in the day of his anger. This is the wicked man's portion from God, even the heritage decreed to him by God. And then in chapter 21, Job says to the wicked, or says of the wicked, he says, They spend their days in prosperity, and suddenly they go down to the grave. And so starting out here, Zophar tells him very plainly, he says the reason that you're suffering, the reason your house is decreasing, the reason you've lost your children, the reason you've lost so many of your possessions, the reason that you are suffering in this way is because God has decided to take these things away from you. Basically he's saying you've not really done anything right. You've not really done anything wrong. God has just decided you're the one that's going to suffer. So many times in the world today we see people going through struggles. They look at themselves and they want to say, why me? They want to blame God and feel that God has just picked them out of the crowd and said, you know what, Tom's going to be the one that's going to suffer today. Folks, that's not the way that it works. And Job understood that. Because Job told these friends very plainly. He said that the wicked spend their days in prosperity and suddenly they go down to the grave. He said the wicked are the ones that suffer in the way you think I'm suffering. He said they spend their days in prosperity and then suddenly they lose everything. But notice he says they go to the grave. They lose their life. 
Job knew that he still had something that God could work with. He knew that he still had life in his body. And he knew that there was something that lay ahead for him. He knew that he was going to be blessed. Job was suffering. He knew he had done no wrong. But others who had done evil, he had seen them live however they wanted to live. And then when suffering came upon them, there was no one there to extend comfort. They did not have God on their side to assist them during those hard times. And they lost everything, including their lives, because God was not with them. But Job knew that God had not departed from him. He knew that even though these three friends, and I use the term friends very loosely, he knew that these three men that had come to see him and to try to bring some comfort to him, he knew that they did not realize how strong his faith was. He knew that these men were simply looking at this situation through the eyes of the world. And they were not looking at it through the eyes of faith. Job knew that everything was going to be all right. But these men felt like that they had to understand everything. They had to have a solution. But many times there's not a solution to be had. Well, finally, after everything was said and done, Job finally cries out to God. And he asks God to do something about these men. Well, God, he intervenes. And he condemns these men. And he tells them that if they do not repent, if they do not offer a burnt sacrifice, then they were going to be lost. And showing that their intentions really were in the right place, but they just got off on the wrong track, they listened to what the Lord said. They repented of what they had done, repented of what they had said, the condemnation that they had uh, predicted upon Job, the pain and the hardship that they brought upon him. They repented of all these things. They offered that burnt offering. They made their lives right. But what we see in these three sorry comforters is an attitude that oftentimes we see in ourselves. Oftentimes we see those who are suffering and so much we want to find a way to help them and to comfort them. So many times we end up causing more pain and anguish to come upon them through the things that we're saying rather than simply being there for them. But what can we learn from these three sorry comforters? We do not need to make assumptions about the struggles that people have. We do not need to assume that their struggles are stemming from some type of sin. We do not need to assume that there is anything in their life that they need to repent of that's going to rectify that situation. We do not need to look at them and try to give them some type of worldly solution. But what we need to do as children of God is we need to be there. We need to be a shoulder to cry on. We need to be there to offer to pray with them, to sit with them, to assist them in any way that we can. But we do not need to fall into the snare that these three sorry comforters fell into by telling them what they've done wrong, by telling them that there's something that they have to do in order to have these things taken away. One of the main religious groups in the world today claiming to be Christians say that you have to come and you have to make a confession to a man. And they say that you have to do this only once a year, but they recommend you do it more than that. But after you come in and you confess all these things to this man, this man then tells you what you have to do to make those things right. And so much of that is based upon assumptions. But folks, whenever we lean upon the word of God and we realize that so often all people need is a word of encouragement, when we realize that God's word should be our guide in all things. 
The word of God is what pricks the heart. It's not the assumptions and the condemnations of, of our fellow man or our fellow Christians. It doesn't work that way. The word of God is what pricks our heart. And through the knowledge of the word of God, really that's what it came down to with Job. It was Job's faith, his understanding of how his life was supposed to be. That's what carried him through. That's what helped him to endure all of those struggles that he faced. And because he endured those things and he stayed strong, he ended up being blessed doubly by God. All of the things that had been taken away, he received a just recompense, I guess you would say. He was restored twofold what had been taken away. And this was because he retained his faithful standing. So when we see those that are hurting, when we see those who are struggling with different situations of life, we need to go to them. We need to cry with them if that's what we feel is appropriate. We need to be that loving and caring brother or sister in Christ. We need to spend time with them. No, I'm not saying that if someone is sick or someone is hurting, you need to go and sit there with them for seven days straight. If I'm ever sick, folks, don't come to my house and sit with me for seven days straight. But that sign, that showing of compassion, showing that true love that we have for one another, that love that we only have because we are children of God. We show that, we display that. People don't need our assumptions. Oftentimes, they don't need our advice. They just need to know that we care. They need to see that we are sympathetic to them. And this is why the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12 and verse 15, to mourn with those who mourn. Just be there. Be that helping hand. Let us do all that we can to never be sorry comforters. Tonight, if you examine yourself and you find that as a child of God, you've not been living your life the way that you should, you find that sin has come into your life and you have wandered astray from the path that leads to heaven, then we would encourage you tonight to be restored to the faith, to repent of your sins, Come forward and let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf. Let us encourage you. Let us study with you. Let us do all that we can to help you in getting your life right with God. Or tonight, if you examine yourself and you find that you're not a Christian, you've never obeyed the gospel, we would encourage you to make that decision tonight. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then tonight, make that decision that you're going to turn away from your sinful life. Repent of those sins and set your sights on things above. Come forward. Confess that faith that you have in Christ. Be baptized. Have those sins washed away. Be raised to walk in that glorious newness of life. The Lord will add you to the church. Tonight, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation for any reason, we encourage you to come while together we stand and sing. I have decided.